Um, got to be honest, that first video was a bit of a trailer just trying to entice you all in there just in case we were talking to ourselves. So it's a great pleasure having with you us today. Um, unfortunately, with our tea today, um, it's this lovely gentleman here, um, Professor Mehana Jury. Fortunately, he um, lives in Te Papa Ioia, down in Palmy, and what's happened with the planes, there have been rolling delays and we just got word two minutes, which, um, you know, makes sense, two minutes prior to standing that his plane's been cancelled altogether, so unfortunately you'll have just me today. So, kōtona te whiu tō ku ingoa, nō ku anō, te māri ngā nui, te whakahaere, me ka whakātu atu, tēnei kōpapa. So today our panel is sharing the unique story of generating whānau leadership under the mantle of a program called Nangatini Petu. A whānau leadership program focused on supporting whānau with tools, networks and new knowledge that enables them to achieve their long term. And when I'm talking about long term, I'm talking about 10 years to generational um, goals and aspirations. Two years ago we started with one pilot for one year which was primarily a research project alongside Bano, and as a result of the one-year pilot, we had two other pilots join the journey. Following on from Dhammason's corridor on Monday, this is just one way of building leadership with the Mafana. We have myself, um, Donna, talking for Waipareira about generating Bano leadership in an urban setting, <coughs> and joining me also is Te Whare Maire o Tapuwai, generating Bano leadership in a rural area, to Te Runanga Te Whan o Te Whano, and I'll be talking about generating leadership in a hapu iwi setting. Each pilot will spend today's panel sharing their own individual journey, challenges and key learnings. The following is our story today. I have included Da Mason's Whano Tino Auto Equation because in effect that has been our journey for the past two years. Inspired leadership for Fano and by Fano. Natini Pitu, a Fano leadership program that was strength based and focused on a Fano achieving their long term goals and aspirations. Two years ago, I was standing in this very room for the 2016 Fano Water Conference when someone put the question forward to Ta Mason, and if you're in here today, Aroha Mai, Jim Fangs today. But they asked this question. All these stories of Fano order are great, but what's next? Hopefully today's panel will provide one option to answer this question. As journey started two years ago in 2016. Now Tini Pitu ki Waipa started a bit like their joke, there was an Englishman, Irishman and a Māori man. But in our case there was a director, a researcher and a project lead. All sitting in a room tasked with helping embed our organisation's generational strategic goal plan by researching and developing a potential leadership program that was focused in the key is on long-term goals and aspirations of Fano and underpinned by Fano order philosophy. In all honesty, we didn't know what we were doing. We had a complete blank canvas to create this program and we had no blueprint or handbook to tell us what to do or guide us on what to do. While exhilarating, it also came with a whole new set of challenges as we had to figure out how to design and implement this exciting new initiative from scratch. Our research showed on a national and international level that when it came to leadership programs, the focus was more on the individual and not the whole whānau. And also specialised in a certain area, for example sports, 
business technology, chron chronically narrowing the field and scope for whānau to determine their own self-determined long-term goals and aspirations. So the roadmap of our journey to look something like this to the far left, where we had many U-turns and lots of 360s and YPNs starting from scratch again with a huge dosage of luck. But the key learning for us at Waipareira is that we decided to buck this trend of individualised leadership and continue on from the success of Whānau Order. We wrap around the entire Whānau and decided to take the whole entire Whānau on the Ngāti Mipitu journey with us. Yeah, but the challenges didn't stop there. The key ingredients of Ngāti Mipitu, again, is strength-based, aspirational and long-term. But we are situated in a, an environment where services are focused on whānau and crisis, their day-to-day -day living, and need to stabilise in our whānau. So not only do we not have the right environment to foster the key of elements of our tinipitu, but we also had a lot of whānau not even in the space of thinking. Our tinipitu ki waipareira has been a two-year journey for us, and with the first year focused on putting whānau leadership, and we constantly ask ourselves, what does this look like? What does this mean? And constantly asking our whānau to help us shape the program. Our own whānau put their own Ngātini P2 plans together, the key focus again on long-term planning, thinking about things like, what type of ancestor do I want to be remembered by? And what type of environment do we want our mūko puna to inherit? inherit? Being aware a lot of these whānau had children and aren't moved even in the space of any mūko puna. This really helped to shape the consciousness of our whānau, their minds and thinking into the Ngātini Pitu space of long-term thinking to the point that it started to become a part of the everyday conversation. While most of our whānau were successful in their own right and thought that they had arrived, for example, they went to uni, kids went to school and they had careers that they loved, we still had whānau working as individuals in the whānau unit. Too busy with whānau and community commitments to have time to stop and plan as a whānau. Most important is that from the Ngātini P2 plans, we then got them to prioritise those goals in order to achieve them. The key learning for us was that no matter how far along whānau are on their journey, to stretch their thinking into that space of whānau community leadership, where they could lead the charge of being the leaders within their own communities, and this requires a lot of up and a lot of time. By the end of the first year, our whānau didn't want to finish the pilot and we had already noticed the involvement in community projects so the natural progression for us was to move into community leadership. So we took on another cohort for whānau leadership and our first cohort became the tuakana and they took the lead of creating their own blueprints for leadership within their own self-identified communities. In total, that was two years ago to get our whānau to fly. From a programme that inspired leadership for whānau just transforming into whānau community leadership program created by our whānau for our very own whānau. We were heavily reliant on our whānau to inform us the whole way of our journey, co-designing this whānau long-term leadership program where our whānau were our very main experts. We then wrapped mentors around them, our local champions, that highly specialised with highly specialised skills and knowledge to inspire them to achieve their long-term goals and aspirations. And to finish up um, my section of the corridor, this is part of their success stories. At the top was when they first started us uh, building their whānau leadership to where they are today and they're still going. For example, to my far left there, I have one whānau um, that launched through Ngātini Whitu their own business. Their kai, their, um, their kai was health. So they launched, as a whānau, a uh, health business that focused on um, Ngātai men that had no fathers within the home. Mm -hmm. And then we took them, oh, sorry, this is a big thing in the city, whānau ma, took them hunting, took them fishing. That's why I've got two mates to extend that story. Um, I also here had one whānau there that started their, um, launched their own business to build her financial wealth for herself her um, only child and her husband. But again, to get to launching her business, I first started off with a financial literacy course, moved into a business course, and then launching her own business. 
um, that wants us to become our very first pop-up store on the ground floor of our Whanau Centre with our community as our clientele. It took two years. Then we had one whānau, they recognised that culture was an um, important priority for them. So this whānau, one went to Te Ara Māori, um, level two, and her tāne went to Te Kura Takiura o Ngā Kura Kaupapa Māori. Mm -hmm. The main goal there, the long-term goal, well that's the beginning, the long-term <coughs> goal is that ensuring that the culture and the real is flowing within their whānau to their tamariki, tamariki and for generations to come. And then we also have a last one on the side here to really challenge the community leadership of our whānau. Um, our dani got together and they launched our very own Aonga Tini Whitu um, He Paraku Hiwa Means Breakfast just to give our tāni that and the people invited were all the whānau across our community of Tāmaki Makoto from the different organisations and their challenge was here, go and they put the whole program, all the guests, and basically our family got to come together one morning and just celebrate being me. Each small step, our whānau took built their confidence and school based to tackle and achieve their whānau long-term goals and aspirations. But that was our journey generating whānau leadership and we recognise that every community is different and what might, be work for us, what might have worked for us will not necessarily work for them and that they might have their own solutions of generating long-term whānau leadership initiatives, but at least we Waipane, the Kuchiraki learnings, and most importantly, not what to do. And that is why I have Te Whare Maire, Tapu Wai, and Tūnunga o Te Whānau joining me today to share their own unique stories. Kōra. Yeah. to the 
We invited Tini, I turned up. At the speed feed, you know, you like to encourage them to keep coming. And I turned up and it was the old, oh, okay, welcome. You know, we're all happy, like, but, um, you know, we got eight at the first hui, and then the numbers started fluctuating because they decided they wanted their hui on a weekday after five o'clock. So we accommodated that, and then we had two whānau turn up. We had no whānau at one hui, and then um, we maintained around about a consistent six or seven going into Christmas, and I don't think if you're getting to a better contract, don't do it before Christmas. Um, you know, our whānau, and to their credit though, we would get lots of apologies, something come up, and sorry I can't come, but at least they apologised. Um, I mean, we couldn't get them to sign their tender sheet like that. Um, they had their day jobs too. They were hard out in the, in, in the community, and um, our stuff wasn't a priority. Like a lot of whānau find their cleaning is, you know, oh, I'm okay, I don't need to clean. <laughs> We also, I think, assumed that because we had selected whānau who were okay in the community, that they were ready to take up this opportunity. And, you know, it was really quite, um, I was actually quite um, surprised at, at how, how unready okay whānau are. And we've been, we've been working with the, you know, whānau that were in crisis, whānau that needed this right there and then. And yet the ones that were okay were really, really hard to stimulate any kind of um, thinking because what do I want? I don't need anything. I'm okay. My kids are okay. Um, so we tried kicking, yeah, I already said that, but um, that was the main thing. It was just a real challenge in, in thinking <coughs> no fun no, and not. So, um, you know, some of the learnings are that we thought we had good relationships, and I mean good relationships. Everyone that was chosen was chosen because we knew them and they were okay. Um, but I think that time and building a relationship on, on, on this basis is totally different to seeing them down the street and having a gossip here on, you know, over a coffee or something. Um, and the time to build good relationships with them was I think really important and we didn't take that time. Take as much time, I mean it's even in the whānau water um, space. One of the biggest areas is whakawhanaumatanga, building that relationship so that they get their confidence and what have you. Well, people are okay, they still need to do that too. And, um, you know, encouraging a mind shift. One of the things was, well, you know, I'm, I'm in there because I, I like helping people be there. And I like helping out and I like being a part of it and I like being a part of it. Oh, okay, so do you think about yourself and your own father? Mm. Oh, too busy to do that. That's real. Those were real comments that came from the group. So, um, and not all the whānau, actually, probably the majority, couldn't look at leveraging and developing on what they have today for future generations. They had a good house, they had a car, the kids were going to school, they were doing well at school. Um, that was it. I'm okay. I don't, I don't, why, why should I? No dreams? They just didn't have dreams. So, um, one of our kairahi that we brought on board to give a hand, she had this um, focus on whānau, you know, the, like, the family that we had engaged with in Kairaki, they had gotten into a planning habit because they knew that if they could get through the goals, they would achieve the outcome. Um, so really she just said, well, even those ones that are okay, you can get their head crack too and get them ready to drink. And so we ended up turning it around to acknowledging those whānau within our kairahi whānau who had got to a point where they had achieved most of, if not all, the goals and outcomes. And um, looking at, here was an opportunity to take them to the next step. So we, we were um, looking at them in 
sort of meeting me neatly or that, but this was an opportunity to start talking a different talk. Okay, so you've done that, you've done that. You know how you said you wanted to own your own home? Shall we have a go at that now? It was just um, developing different conversations, I suppose, with the whanau who had gotten into the habit, if I can talk, say that, um, of planning and having had the, um, you know, real good buzz of having achieved small goals and then, well, I did that, I did that. So those ones were easier, we found, found it easier to dream than the ones that were okay because they never got into the planning anything. Um, <clears throat> so, these were um, some of the challenges that we looked at in the whole um, outcome, the framework that we were asked to um, develop at the end. And I've covered most of those, but a lot of our whānau preferred that we go one-on-one -on -one with their whānau rather than get them into a group situation to start looking at any of the stuff that we wanted them to look at. And so we had to get on a point five kairahi to assist there because there was only a white lot of whānau. It was sweet as we'll just get these groups together and we'll just help to encourage them to all develop a plan and all good, but it didn't work like that because um, people weren't confident enough to share their stuff within a group situation. Um, we, the inconsistent attendance also made it really hard to actually ensure that we had involved the whānau in the development or taking part in or you know, what kind of programme should we, should we run, what kind of activity should we run. If, they couldn't talk to us, so we didn't really know. So by about the end of the second quarter, it was, we haven't run any activities, we haven't done any one we haven't done any workshop. What the hell shall we do? Some of the farmers said, well, you do it. You plan it, you, you put something on it and we'll come along. So we did that. And that was at the whānau direction, you know, the whānau that was supposed to be self-directing their, their stuff. Um, so we had already identified all the people in the community that could be mentors, advisors, specialists and what have you. And we got about um, planning the first ever, fun, what was it? The Wairau Family Leadership Workshop. So um, we, we ran that and it was really successful. We got a huge turnout. We use local, as I said, look within before you start going out and finding all these flash people. Um, we got local resources, and when we come to the last bit, you'll just see how much we don't even appreciate the local resources that we've got. Um, we found that we had to take the lead and start encouraging Farm Home. Um, we didn't, because we relied that the Farm Home were ready. Um, you know, we expected them to be delivering at our time frame in the contract requirement rather than at their pace. Uh, in retrospect, if we had taken the lead sooner, we might have had more fun to engage. <laughs> and the time it took to establish could have been really minimised, the benefits to the family could have been more maximised. So the leadership programme. Um, this was some of the stuff that we looked at during, you know, like encouraging the long-term planning and all that. We did appreciate how, despite the contract hiccups at first, it actually allowed us the flexibility for Te Pāti Māori to develop the programme that best suited the unique needs of white women. We weren't made to say you've got to do A, B, C. You had to do A, B, C, but it was whatever you did to make it happen. And that was really appreciated in the end. And the fact that we were a pilot and we were just trying things was good. Um, so we ended up building an initiative that support, really supported our whanau. And um, we can hand on heart now say that we have whanau that have actually started long-term generational plans. 
I mean, albeit the last quarter of the of the whole project, but um, we went round and round the mulberry bush, and then we got to where we needed to go. And um, like I said, we got specific um, resources local, and I think that was the other thing about the whole contract was it provided a resource to be able to support Farmo to do that in terms of mentors and putting on um, activities <coughs> and interview. Um, because we looked at focusing in on Kairahi Farmo, uh, we don't get that kind of resource with that, so I think that if it was ongoing, um, that the least that should be made available is that resource to make sure that those um, Farmo needs are met. Um, so, success if you can call it that. The leadership workshop was real successful. We had over 50 Farno and we had 43 sign up on the attendance sheet. Um, <coughs> of that Farno, we had three of our Farno with three generations attend, and we had five Farno clusters from the Martin and Fetu and the Wairahi Farno. So, the eight, the eight uh, guest speakers. Uh, guest speakers were, um, that, we were, that we invited. <coughs> we had a couple of links to one, and all but one speaker in the group being born and bred in Wairua. Um, believe it or not, there were three speakers who were self made millionaires, and no one in that room knew it. One had flown over for business from Melbourne, and when he stood up, it was just, oh, what's he doing here? He's a multi millionaire, you know. <laughs> Um, the other two walked in in shorts and bush shirts because they'd been putting up a fence at the at the early park because of their father's unmailing the next weekend. Both millionaires, both self-made millionaires. They could all relate to the family that were there in terms of, yeah, I went to Warren College and I got booted out of Mr. Watson and you remember? You know, I mean, they were, and I don't know, the inspiration that they gave off was quite amazing, you know, because I didn't think he could do that, you know, and oh, is that your um, hummer downstairs? <laughs> uh, you know, so we, we looked at, we didn't have these people to invite, and if we hadn't been able to invite them, we probably couldn't have afforded all the flights and the accommodation and what have you. Um, but they were flesh it then, those big flesh people, because they were real, how far they related to them, and um, they were successful. We had other whānau through whānau order, or kairāhi whānau, <coughs> that had developed their own businesses, um, and they told the good and the bad to them. And, and that was really great, and you know, people thought, wow, well, she's a single mother with three kids, and she did that. Oh, I should think about that. I mean, as, as you can in retrospect, if we had to put that on in the beginning and just said, no mind waiting for the family to do anything, we'll do it ourselves and see what it brings. Well, actually we would have saved a lot of time and heartache, really. Um, so, because they spoke from a perspective that the family who were being new, um, it, it was really inspirational. Just, you know, I'm, I'm not sort of trying to make anything look great. It's real. It really happened. So um, we've maintained <coughs> um, and fully employed the 0.5 Kuaerahi, as you can appreciate. We've got six Nātani Fetu Whānau who have continued to develop their Whānau plans um, as a means to continue the Nātani Fetu in its the kaupapa. Um, we actually have been identifying Kuaerahi Whānau who are nearing completion of the Kaurahi plans because there's nowhere for them to go. You monitor them and then you say, oh, how's your savings going? How's this going for six months, maybe a year after? But, um, you know, are we encouraging them to take that next leap? And that's what I think this is giving us the opportunity to do. So Kaurahi, if I know we deal with, it's really immediate, short, sometimes medium term. But Nātini Fetu, you've got them after they pass it that stage and you're looking at medium long term. And that's me.
nga tini au me tanga o te wā. Tātou katoa ko whakarauika mai i ngai te karanga o o wā mātou pēhi, mā mātou tamariki mō kuna tēnā kai te tokoa. Ko kiri tāmi hire waititi a hau, hei uri i nō ngā te prau o ngā pēmi te whakatohia. I moe au ki o tō te whānau apanu, ko tamariki, hei uri no te whānau apanu. Ngā kute wai mari e i tēnei wā ki te tū, hei māhe mai mō te imi. Kei te tino hikata te ngākau anō hoki, ko tau mai taku tīma, hei tau tuara mōku i tēnei rangi tonu. E hika mā, what you might know of te whānau apanu is that they are very, very, very humble people. So I just want to acknowledge my team who are sitting up here. It took forever to drag them to come down just to sit here. But but when they do make a sound, they choose their fights very wisely. When they make a sound, it's for a good reason. This is one of them. So we're really privileged to be chosen as a pilot location for our Natini Fetu Kaupapa. Uh, but just to provide a bit of context for where we're on heading, um, Whanapuni is made, of 13, made up of 13 hapu. Um, we span across 100 kilometres of coastline. Um, this here is the Whanapuni team that services the whole of them. Um, so they're, they're, and we're an hour and a half away from the nearest supermarket in town. So we have our own challenges. Um, te runa no te whānau is mandated by 11 of the 13 hapunu te whānau whanau. Um, so we're quite clear in the runa no space that we are the mahi function of the iwi, kārehe mana i wā i wā mātou mahi, ko te mana ka noho ki oto i ngā hapunu. So everything we do, we're told to do by the iwi, uh, by ngā hapunu. Um, one of the things that I picked up to um, a town in Cornham, Britain, Auckland, going into um, Whānau Apunu. And outside of Whānau Apunu, they will all say that um, they're from Whānau Apunu. Ki roto te Whānau Apunu, there are 13 little iwi that have their own function and their own systems. Um, and that's, a, that's the hapu-centric model that is very, very strong in the Whānau Apunu. So we were super wrapped when we um, got this contract. And um, we thought, OK, we had Donna here who done their thing with Waipanae and we thought, what we want to do So one of the requirements is that we had to work with 15 whānau. So we thought, okay, we already have this hapu structure, so let's just do what they did and try and pull in 15 whānau. Now how are we going to do that? So we thought the best thing to do would be for us to set up this hapu model. Um, so this is take one of our long journey. <coughs> so we had a hapu model and um, we were going to choose one family, so there's 13 hapu within the iwi. We had to work with 15 whānau, so we said, okay, we'll just choose a, a champion whānau from each hapu and a couple of extras. So what we had to do then is we spent a lot of time going around <coughs> talking to um, the different hapu, different community members about who these whānau might be. And we wanted whānau that were doing well and whānau that um, had big impact on their, own, on their own hapu. That on its own took a really long time because we had to be super careful about um, when we identified who they would be. Um, we knew other people would say, how come that whānau got chosen over this whānau? <laughs> so we had, to do, we had to do a lot of um, survey. Uh, but that took us some time. But we, we got to a point where we identified 15 families and we were so super excited about this because we thought, yay, we're going to do a Waipanema number and work with all of these 15 families. So we were so happy. <laughs> and we set up our first week, like Mo, at the Tikaha Resort because we thought we're going to go in the middle to give everyone an opportunity to get there. Tikaha Resort, big Kai put on this fancy, fancy ass thing. Um, and this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> um, and it wasn't it wasn't actually that bad, so we had a couple there, but it felt pretty bad at the time. Um, and we tried this for a number of months, um, and the and the difficulty um, 
I think we were, we were, we were getting really disheartened about the kaupapa. Um, and we started to reflect on what some of those issues were. And this is a map of far up, I mean, like I said, it's 100 kilometres of coastline we have to travel. Um, so the biggest problem actually was geography, which is getting me. Um, but our whānau champions, they were all working. So they had to get to us after work. And when you're living in Whanaapuna, you also have responsibilities to your hapu. So weekends weren't an option because there's always something happening at the Moana the weekend. So we had to choose uh, a night in the middle of the week to do that. It just didn't suit anybody. Um, the other issue that we had was is costs. So we only have one petrol bowser in Whanaapuna, and it's in Waiho Bay in Whanaapuna. Um, and we start at Hawaii. The next one is the Kimutiki. So just getting there with the petrol was a major issue. Um, the next problem, and, and, and Mo alluded to that, was the readiness of our whānau. So while they were Hapu champions, um, they weren't quite ready at that point to be looking far beyond what was in front of them. Um, and a lot of them were, it was quite offensive for some of them actually, who actually just want to put some bread on the table when you're talking about financial literacy down the, down the line. So <coughs> that didn't float very well. Um, the other issue is connectivity. So it's just a, it was a logistical nightmare trying to get everybody together. Um, the only cell phone reception is at Whanapraua. So the rest of the iwi has no cell phone reception. Not everybody has telephones. Not everybody has internet access. So. Just to get to 15 people, I had to email, I had to ring, I had to Facebook, I had to door knock and all sorts, and it was just getting um, really difficult. So um, that didn't eventuate, so we had to go back again. So this is picking up on the U-turns that we've all experienced in the 360s. Um, take two. Um, what ended up happening, we thought, okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do now? Um, and the timing was an issue for us because we were feeling the pressure to be able to get some outcomes out within the time frame. Um, and then we thought we'd come up with an EMI stakeholder model because all these people that we were talking to about <coughs> community and hard movements, um, these were the people that were truly invested in what was happening in the EMI. Um, and some just started inviting themselves when they were hearing about this Tini Fetu Kaupapa. They said, well, I'm going to come to that dinner, I'm going to come to that dinner. So, lo and behold, we end up with a group um, of hapu leaders, a doctor, um, the police, our teachers, we've got three kuna and our iwi, um, the two principals, plural, that's two, the two principals, um, our final water practitioners, so our whole team is part of that. We had trustees on our kuna boards and also on our land boards, um, tohunga for the hahi, and small business owners. So these people, um, on a daily basis, get to collectively see the whole enemy. Um, and they have skin in the game, and they figure it is on the pulse of what's happening all the time. These, um, these ones here keep asking, well, why don't, we, why don't we be that group? And then we can help facilitate some change with the enemy. And then when we had a really good think about it, um, there's, we, we've got 22, we've got 22 um, in our, in our Natsumi Fetu at the moment. And when we had a good reflection of it, actually every single one of them represent all of the Hapu Mani, so they were the Hapu champions. But we just, we, we, we tried, uh, I think one of the things that we really um, struggled with in the beginning was that we tried to do what my player did. And that's what tripped us up in the first place. So we got this model. And we were so happy because everybody was turning up. We would have dinners and they would all come and there would be no question about it. If I didn't have one in one month, I'd get people saying, hey, when are we going to have our next month in the two meetings? So this was a win for us. This was such a win. Then we had to decide together um, on how we were going to invest our money. So we decided quite early on um, that everything we do in front of me it is to impact the iwi not individual whānau. Uh, mā tātou, uh, ko, te, ko te whānau ora, kei roto i ngā ora, kei roto i te ora ngā o ngā haku. And so whānau ora is 
nothing, a tapu ora. So, mina kai te ore ore ngā hapu, kai te ore ore anō hoki ngā whanau. So, any, any type of resource or funding that comes into us, our first thought is how are we going to be, how are we going to get this stretched across that 100 kilometres to all of our babies and all of our whanau. Um, so, we, we needed to be clear on impact, which means we always have to be innovative. A lot of you would know um, those that work in rural areas, we have to get clever with how we spend them. Yeah. Um, so we're investing in knowledge and then we've decided, okay, how, what, what are we going to invest in? Okay, hang on a minute. Everyone's doing outcomes and knowledge. Why don't we come up with like an up and new outcomes model? So we thought um, that we'd start with that. And then based on that kaupapa, then we would know where we were going to invest our future. Um, so we broke up into workshops and the first part of it, um, was what would up and bring up into your life in today's society. And up and bring up into Koya de Tikuna Matua or Tifana Apuri. Tifana Apuri is named after up and reading up. So we wanted it to come from that lens. If we're looking at up and reading up into, what would it look like today? And what is he going to look like in the future? Um, and it was really neat because everybody ended up coming up with really similar similar for Carl, so everybody was on the same wavelength. And our stakeholder, um, our stakeholder group had a really intimate knowledge about the iwi. They were all born and bred in the iwi. So those, um, these are only titles. Um, first and foremost, and the most, uh, the, the beauty about them all, born and bred to find out the So they're heavily invested in the kaupapa and ensuring that their tamariki wokukuna are flourishing in the future. These things here are just bonuses for us. Um, so, beautiful questions, yes, and then we come up with this called outcome form that we have called Boy Baba. Um, and there are six key domains we identified um, environment that we want our hokokuna to live in harmony in the Dao Tuluwa. Haukura, we want our hokokuna to be healthy, tina na hine nga wai ura whanai. Technology, we want our hokokuna to be excelling in the use of technology every day. Economic development. We want our mokukuna to live in a successful economic community. And finance. We want our mokukuna to be financially secure. So um, we had a really robust conversation about this. Um, and we got further into it being interested in And then decided, right, well, what, how do we know that we're achieving it? That we're achieving that. So we come up with milestones um, for each. The milestones were our were our indicators that we were creating some change. And the activities were about what, what we were going to invest in. So that's what we wanted to get to. Right, we've got this money, the activities are what we're going to invest in to boost up the outcomes. And the other thing that we did is we um, as an iwi thinking from an iwi lens, we, we rated the iwi actually um, out of 100% of where we think we're sitting currently. I don't want to put those up because they're really bad. Um, but it gave us a really good indication as to where we want to be heading. Um, Hoi anō, um, there was a hell of a lot of work that had gone into this and um, the beauty about it all was all the whānau that were there, there was nothing in it for them nothing in it for them but the future of our tamariki and that's what I loved about it is there was no money, no, well there was a kai, it always brings people but when you have to travel 40 minutes for that it's a different story. So we did that, um, hell of a lot of work um, and then we had this <coughs> light bulb moment and that was pretty big for us because then someone said um, it's all very well having all those activities and everything like that how the hell are we going to get our people to them? We do this all the time. We've got all the services for Africa. We have all these cool workshops. What makes you think someone's going to travel um, 45, 50 minutes to get to a financial literacy course when they've got six babies, no petrol, no car? Um, and we're sort of a little bit stumped by that one. Um, and I thought this encapsulated this. Um, pretty well. So we did a whole lot of work and Kare Hikuwa Yoto, if our 
people are going to come to it. So then we had to go back to um, the drawing board, and this was a big uh, profile that came out at the same time, was that we're doing the same thing over and over again, and then we're expecting different results. So we had to really um, think hard about what we were going to do differently. To get our people the outcomes model, it's awesome if your, our people are in the right space to be able to receive to be able to receive all the knowledge that we're wanting to invest in. Um, take three. <laughs> um, I think I need a drum roll sign for this. Um, this enters like blow the block in your campaign. Um, so after reflecting on us trying to perpetuate um, the band-aid model that is our mental health, social health system. Um, we had a really good think about, well, if we need to get our people into a space to receive these things, what do we need to do? Um, the biggest thing that came out of that was um, and, and it's, it's really it's really helpful for me to know that that's, that's a common thing that I've been hearing throughout this um, one and is about getting into it. So we know that our people every day when they wake up and they turn on their television, they see how bad they are. They're waking up every morning and knowing that we've got the highest statistics and um, everything, everything in the world. It's not inspiring. Our people are waking up uninspired. And the other thing too is we've done it to ourselves as well. So we, um, we've colonised ourselves in the way we treat one another. And it comes out often in our language, in the way we talk to one another. Um, so Quote Rapanui campaign is about um, healing our people, healing our spirits first, to get them to a point where financial literacy is something that they can actually be open to. Um, the other part of it is about taking that control of how we perceive ourselves, reclaiming our identity through our own stories, celebrating our own strengths and all that is good about us. And we want everybody to embody all that is up and moving up to. So what does that look like? So we've chosen a story um, one of the one of the main stories for how Apanui <coughs> came about was um, in relation to uh, some wars that he was having with um, a fella called Hikawera from Matipuro. Um, I'm not going to go into that story because we don't have time, but um, we have four key huara that have come out of um, that kaupapa, that kōwera. Um, these, these four uara now are driving every single thing that we do in our whānau water space, but also because of the con connections that our people and our Matini Whetu have, it's been driven out right through the year. So these are the messages that we're preaching all the time, and that's Haere Te Tōha O Tera, and that's to never be afraid to seek knowledge or mātana outside, just as Apanui did. Apanui's war strategy needed external input. Became predictable and needed to help rethinking, learning, and unlearning. So that tells us that research is important. It's always, um, always to seek knowledge to improve, being open to seeking help and support, being open minded to alternatives, always seeking critical uh, feedback and critical reflection. Next one is Tirikawa. That's a rock. Te topa Tirikawa, kei te tauranga moa. That tells us about perseverance and leadership. Um, determination, holding on to your values, strength, courage, confidence, bravery in the face of adversity, and knowing that you have time to the past. Um, the next uara is Karo. So in the story, um, Apanu Ningabutu was asked to observe the flight of the Karo, the seagull. Um, and every time the waves come, came in, it would set a flight, and they would all um, set a flight together. So that, that teaches us about being able to respond to new conditions. Um, that things change and we must be able to respond to the changing environments that we live in. Um, it's also about being able to innovate, it's being able to adapt to change, working together, collective responsibility and cohesion. And the last one is the kawai. Um, so from the flight of a kawai, we're reminded to always keep a bird's eye view perspective on things and be able to see the whole into the mechanism things at a high level as well as a fish eye view. So what we know from the kawai, which is a shag, is that it, it will fly around, it will fly around 
until it sees its target and it never misses because it takes its time. So that's about being vigilant, gathering all the data and information aspects of the situation before acting. It's about being strategic, taking the time and being comprehensive in your approach. So this is what we're investing in. And um, we're wanting to roll it out across the EU. Only on that, that story, and this is a small story, um, we plan to flood State Highway 35 with the billboards that are all about our people and what they're doing. And that's hashtag. Um, we have developed a therapy tool for our whanau that all of these guys, when they go out to do the assessments, the first thing they do is they tell that story and they apply it to the life that's happening for that whanau. Um, we've had examples of um, Te Reriti has gone and sat with a boy um, and did some mahi with him around Tirikawa and um, Haere Te Tōma o Te Rā and he's using that in his how he manages his own behaviour at school. So mm -hmm. there are some really cool things that have come out of that. We're um, in the process of having a digital campaign. So what we want is for an animated version of our story to come out but that's developed by our own kids. So we've got people coming down to do workshops, animation workshops to teach them um, how to put an um, animated story together but the key part of it is the messaging so it's our way of ensuring that they <coughs> engage with that story. Um, merchandising, so why bother me? That's just um, something that is a tangible, um, something that we can just put into our kaupapa. Um, educational resources, another one, so we're looking at developing apps and puka puka around numeracy, literacy for our tamariki so that um, we can engage, they can engage with that story and the beauty about the story is that it can, we can develop it at all sorts of different levels. Um, any policy, so we're working on that um, and the beauty about um, our Martini Setu is that they actually encapsulate all of the um, they are all the people that make the policy and the, they're the principals and they're the teachers. And so we've been going in and doing some professional um, development with, our, with the kura. Um, in terms of the educational and therapy tool, we're going, we're sitting down with our kura to develop a behavioural management tool. So there's a PB4L that um, mm -hmm. schools use. Um, they're wiping that and they're going to adapt our model so that they can use that with their own tamariki and our kura. The EU engagement is a really important one too. So our policeman that we work with very closely, every time he goes out to a domestic violence incident, he's talking tirikawa and he's talking haere ki te tōma o te rā all the time. Our doctor, so it's driving that in, in every facet of what we're doing as far as Our doctor's doing the same thing, so she's talking tirikawa, come on haere ki te tōma o te rā, there's no use you just sitting there being sick, you need to come to me, that's what haere ki te tōma o te rā means. Tirikawa means you need to be healthy and you need to be strong for your tamariki. So we, we're, it's about changing that language um, and getting everybody in this space where we're lifting one another and we're using our tipuna up and we to get there. Um, so the challenges that we experience going through this process uh, were quite... Uh, the time was an issue. Um, and that was because we didn't have much of it. But um, we just took our time anyway. <laughs> um, but the beauty about that is um, it did get us into gear about with, with a number of things. But the biggest, um, the biggest challenge that we had, and I'm calling it freedom, and the reason why I'm calling it that is because when I read that contract, it actually had Hardly, the only requirement was that we had to work with 15 whānau. Kitty and we, we are so used to being told what to do every step of the way. And this contract didn't have that at all. But in my mind, dealing with the normal funding and funding rules, I went and computed that to think, oh my gosh, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this. Um, so, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. <laughs> Like my parade, we actually had to be pumo to who we were and made things so much easier. 
And in the time that it took, and the take one, two, three, four, I don't know at what point we thought that that was wrong. That's what we do. Mona made reference to going around the mulberry bush. That's what we do. That's how we get to where we need to get to. There's nothing wrong in that. So when we acknowledged actually, no, that's okay, because it was an organic process and it was something that evolved, and it really did emerge from the bottom up, and that was the beauty about it. And when you let that course, when you let it take its course, that's what happens, because you're learning and you're adapting like a cuddle, which is what we had to do all the time. And so rather than seeing that as a weakness, I saw that as a real strength for us to just be able to cruise through that and go with it. Um, so there have been so many key learnings for us. Everyone has a different starting point, so you'll see that the three of us started at a completely different spaces. We didn't end up doing anything individual with our farmer. We invested in, um, we had, uh, people came to us and said, oh look, we've seen your outcomes model and we want you to invest in this, and we did that. But our biggest co-papa is co-papa, I mean, that was an accident. You know when you go and type in things and you need to go delete? Um, workshops and programs and services, yeah. and, Jack, and they do, when people aren't in the space to be able to receive those, so we needed to get our people into that. We need to build the right foundation, that for us is global up and based on our tikuna koreo. And that we have the answers and to not be afraid and to not keep looking for answers in black and white that our funders, we think our funders give us. And the other thing that I learned is that we need to trust ourselves. We keep looking at other models, we know what's good for us. And that, that has come out so much in our kōrero, that we'll be with our, our nannies, Fire Livy, I uh, loved your kōrero last night, and Dame Tariana was just, it's about healing our spirits, and we, we, know, we know what works, and we need to trust in who we are, and, and, and be fearless, fearless in that, so that's what. Where we are now, so we're investing our money now in lifting the spirits of our people, you know the things that don't have a dollar sign attached to it? Um, our Martini Fetu, who are now invested as well for our Papanui campaign and driving the messaging through their mahi. Our Martini Fetu, who has officially become the steering group for Whanau Ura and Te Whanau Whanui. So everything we do um, is based on the accordion. But I just wanted to leave you with this. I'm running out of time. I talk way too much. Um, this is our Martini Fetu. This little girl here goes to, young woman, goes to school at Whanapuni Kura. Three weeks ago, she was sitting in the Prime Minister's seat. So if, if we can get that for a girl in Tikaha from Whanapuni, then that's our tino whaenga for us. Um, I, I just want to actually acknowledge that um, Te Koe Matakana, we are super, super grateful for being given the opportunity to do this. Nobody would ever, would ever let us um, fly this work up a new flag without the red tape. And there was no red tape here. And I made some red tape in the beginning until I got rid of it. Moi ano, kia ora tato, e te iwi. I just want to finish off with that. We, we bought our some armour with our babies. Our babies did a song for us. And we're going to tag on to that. Um, <coughs>
our journey through pilots. As you can see, three completely different environments, three completely, uh, completely different environments. There's myself sitting um, as a project lead that works with these two pilots. Um, <coughs> myself sitting, I'm trying to generate leadership in a urban setting. And you see all the way down in a rural city down on Wairua, Waikari Moana, Ngati Kahununu, all the challenges that they face. And then we go down to Tukiri where we have the kaha. And you truly see a model that was based on the tipuna. And it's embedding through their whole um, iwi hapu now. So now they have a they their whānau designed their assessment tool, permeates through everything that they do. You see the whānau sitting here today and that's going to take them for generations to come. So while we did have a lot of challenges, um, it's accelerating at the same time because they came up with um, solutions straight away how to go with that. 100k. Again, um, my first two with Kitty, um, they were driving um, 45 minutes up to the resort and Barno were ringing from house from funny to funny to try and catch them. <laughs> so how do you create a leadership program when there's no internet, you can't ring them, you can't text them, that's reality when you're trying to contact Kitty. So that is a challenge with us um, here today. So taking away again, um, now, to is to is uh, about moving to strength-based, aspirational, and long-term thinking. While the thinking is great, and as you just saw today, it comes with a lot of challenges, we need to first ask if we, as organisations, <coughs> hapu, iwi, are equipped with the capability and capacity to grow our whānau into this innovative space of thinking. For them, furthermore, we need to ask ourselves, are our whānau ready? We had learned that we had to be really flexible in terms of our contract obligations. And Ngātini Pitu is based on a high level of trust, where we had to believe in our pilots, knowing that no one knows their whānau or communities better than themselves. So Ngātini Pitu is about empowering our whānau and communities to come up with their own solutions. Our presentation from three parts today was about planting a seed, a challenge for all of you sitting here today. Our whānau will not always be sitting in a state of languishing. Generations are coming through with te reo, with education. But are we as an iwi ready and equipped to support these whānau to truly achieve their tino whānau order, or their whānau tino order? So my final riddle um, for us, we are three pilots sitting before you today who have shared their journey. What would happen if you joined our fight ensuring that us as Māori are continually in this innovative space, continually growing, aspiring to achieve whānau tino ora. How amazing would our whānau be when they are the leaders coming up with their own solutions and driving forward for us as my Māori. Māori ora.
Whanau Apunu, nine months. Mo, nine months. And they are sharing the stories on behalf of their whanau. Just imagine we had our whanau in front of you. All leadership, all at first, again, that makes our whanau leadership, but now they're becoming our leaders within the community, driving for us. in the therapy talk we think for a long hour. So I'm going to keep that hidden and diagnosed and once they are, well, it's too late. But, but anyway, if we can capture them moving out, these are our ability to feed out for spectrum disorders. I don't know, but in the solution at the moment it seems to be just a drug they want. I'm really interested in that particular part of your body book today around the alternative from the technology perspective. I assume that that's all part of it. I won't leave it. And um, yeah, just just wanted to maybe just there's a link there where we can get more about that to get a very talk today, but um, where we can access some of that footing and, and I think that's the key area we can kind of support our company. That's part of the whole equation to you know the what I'm doing. <coughs> about that was we, we had spent a lot of time building the right relationships in the first place for us. We can't, we, we know that we can't um, push this model out on, a, on our own. So it was really important that we had um, buy-in from all the schools and it made it so much easier for us to develop a tool like that. So my bad, I'm a clinical psychologist and so it was, it was um, what, what we did do is actually we started with the cordial first and the kaupapa, uh, the, the iwi kaupapa of it, and then Ma Kuke, I pulled in what I thought aligned really well with it from that westernised view to complement. Mm -hmm. So I think what we've, um, we've done it the other way around with the class and So we've had all these Pākehā models and then the dragon, the Māori things that we think is complementing it, but this was a complete shift. Um, and that also one more, so most of it is that we have our own tōrana. Okay? We're, clinical, we're clinical psychologists without being having the title. Um, so um, I didn't do too much, but put a frame around the knowledge that is already there and translated it probably a little bit um, into the way it can be applied better in school. So it's, it's, a, it's a real work in progress and we're <coughs> continuously reviewing how that, how that goes. <coughs> it's not a part of it, it's just a congratulate you. I think uh, powerful woman that stood before me you started from scratch and to share your story with, with us, how beautiful and everything you've gone through. Mm. I've come into a company that's already done their pilot and already working there. Yeah, I'm a player here and that we're working mm. uh, The stuff that I see that you do, <coughs> longevity, long, long term, right through, I feel mm. we're just a plaza here. So taking away some of the things that you shared today, I'd like to think we could work outside the box of what we've been told to do through a contract. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Rami Kyamkota for everything and champions you are and we'll try to thank you. Thank you. Thank you.